next panel is called Climate Change, Problems and Solutions, Local to Global. And the moderator and people on this panel have been in the trenches doing the real work and providing leadership in this area, and they have a firm grasp on the urgency of these matters. Your moderator, who you met earlier on the previous panel, is David Orr. He's the Paul Sears Distinguished Professor of Environmental Studies and Politics. Sorry, I just scrawled everything really big. It's a bad eyesight. He's also a uh, um, professor at the University of Vermont. He's also the author of five books, published 150 articles in scientific journals, social science publications, and popular magazines, received many awards, and sitting on numerous distinguished boards, and is best known for his pioneering work on environmental literacy in higher education and his recent work on ecological design. On the panel, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., early in his career, Bobby served as assistant DA in New York City. He acts as the chief prosecuting attorney for the Riverkeeper and senior attorney for the NRDC. He's president of the Waterkeeper Alliance, credited with leading the fight to protect New York City's water supply and winning numerous settlements, prosecuting governments and companies for polluting the Hudson River, the Long Island Sound. He's um, arguing cases to expand citizen access to shoreline to shoreline and suing treatment power plants for forcing, uh, sorry, and suing treatment plants to force compliance with the Clean Water Act. He's helped lead the fight to turn back the aggressive anti-environmental legislation during the 104th Congress, has published several books, and assisted several indigenous tribes in protecting their traditional homelands. Michelle Wyman currently serves as executive director for the ICLEI U.S. office. Prior to this position, she was the director of the Natural Resources Department for the city of Fort Collins. Her areas of expertise include sustainable development, environmental management systems, and domestic and international public management. And finally, Bill Becker. Bill is the executive director of the Presidential Climate Action Project. He's the former director of the U.S. Department of Energy's Central Regional Office, where he specialized in energy efficiency, renewable energy technologies, and sustainable community development. Bill's specialization in sustainable, sustainable development began in the 1970s when he proposed and helped to implement a pioneering project relocating a community from a floodplain and built the nation's first solar village. Please welcome your panel. Subject. So here we are at the Democratic National Convention. Uh, environmental issues are obviously huge. They have not factored in important ways in previous presidential elections. Will they in this election? And if so, why? Uh, Bobby, let me start with you. Pass this down. The question is, are they going to have an impact in this election? Um, I, I think they're going to have the issues going to have an impact in this election more than any other election we've seen. Um, in the last election, you had the Democratic candidates talking a lot about this issue, but you had almost no press coverage. So with John Kerry and the election before that, Al Gore, I often complained to them and said, how come you're not focusing on Al Gore, particularly how come you're not focusing on your strong sweep? And he said, I'm mentioning the environment in every speech that I give, it's just the press doesn't pick it up. Um, and, uh, but that has changed this year. Uh, the press is beginning to recognize that this is the defining issue of our time. The environment and, uh, and the way that the, the ancillary issue, the way that we use energy in this country, are really the central fulcrum issues for all of the other issues that concern Americans, for our, our domestic prosperity, for our national security, for our foreign policy. The biggest foreign policy issue that we have in this country, and Barack Obama has said this, even John McCain has acknowledged this, is our reliance on foreign oil. We're borrowing a billion dollars a day from people who don't like us and don't share our values mainly to buy, to import oil from people who don't like us and don't share our values. This the, and that money is being used in many ways to fund the Madras schools, to 
um, uh, to, uh, to supply terrorists, to enrich people whose interests are hostile to those of the United States. If this has caused the collapse of the American dollar. It's weakened our leadership around the world. It's damaged our prestige. It has dramatically increased or, or uh, damaged our balance of, of trade. Uh, it has increased our budget deficit enormously. So um, uh, from a foreign policy staff point of view, the best thing that we can do is to get off of oil. Uh, from a domestic standpoint as well, we have, the, we have other sources of energy in this country that are much cheaper, much more abundant. Uh, we have the best solar in the world. We have the best wind resources probably in the world. We have tidal resources. We have geothermal resources. If we employ people in those sectors, we get green color jobs that cannot be outsourced. And this and, and the um, and energy conservation is the best economic stimulus package because it um, because it enriches every American. So and this is something that has now been elevated. It is part of the debate. Both John McCain and Barack Obama have, a, have endorsed cap and trade systems. Other than that, there's a big departure between the two candidates, but clearly this is an issue that both candidates have taken strong stands on, and it's an issue that the press is finally beginning to cover. Father, thank you. Any uh, comments from Michelle, Bill? I add only to that that we, we've seen both through the, the relevance and the scaling of the issue, also the influence and the recognition of solutions. Those solutions are coming primarily from local governments that have been implementing different climate actions for more than 15 years, and they can speak to, from a data perspective, the benefits, whether it's from an economic lens, a livability lens, a public health lens, the data exists to support the arguments around economic stimulation. As Daryl mentioned, I'm in charge of a program that actually David Orr thought of to develop a 100-day action plan for the next president. And our purpose is to do as much of the homework in advance so the president can get a very, very fast start within the first 100 minutes, in fact, of taking office. Uh, but I'm a firm believer that even though we need to work at that level, no president, no candidate for political office is going to be able to tackle this problem as aggressively as he or she needs to without public support. So while we're working at the national level, many of you are involved with the grassroots, and we need a public outcry, we need a mandate, we need to demand boldness from the next Congress, the next president. And if we do that, I think our leaders will have a chance to lead us the way we need to be led to solve this problem. Second question for uh, Michelle. Michelle, this is a, uh, the year we select a president, attention's on federal policy. But you run an organization, the most dynamic organization involved with city and regional governments. What would you want a President McCain or Obama to do in terms of federal policy relative to state and local and city policies? What can they do for you? The most important part of intelligent, effective federal policy at this point to help accelerate the progressive action that local governments have already been taken is one not to preempt the aggressive leadership that they have already implemented, not to preempt their ability at a local level to set targets that they can achieve. Also, not to provide unfunded mandates to them, rather to look to local governments, bring them to the table, ask them based on their experiences, again, that they, they bring to the table with data, with quantified measurements where they can speak to the benefits that will result from certain climate actions and inform federal policy from that lens, supporting their ability and legislating in a way that will only re reinforce their local authority to get the work done. Bobby, do you have a comment? Um, well, I, I would say that the top priority for the next administration, you know, people can ask what's the solution to our energy problems in this country. Is it drilling off the coast? Is it clean coal, which is, uh, which in my view does not exist? Um, uh, the answer is a broad pro portfolio of solutions, but the principal uh, centerpiece of those solutions is free market capitalism, a free market economy. We need a marketplace where entrepreneurs, where energy innovators, um, and businesses can sell cheaper forms of energy. 
the, um, the, the bigger obstacles to, uh, to a sensible energy policy in this country are, um, are, uh, are marketplace obstacles. Number one, the huge subsidies that we're giving to oil and coal. We give a trillion dollars a year in subsidies to the oil industry. We give a trillion dollars a year in subsidies to the coal industry. We give a half a trillion dollars in subsidies every year to the nuke industry. And that prevents much more efficient and cleaner forms of energy from entering the marketplace. There's other impediments that are, um, that are just as great. The biggest impediment is that we don't have a transmission system in this country that can carry the electrons that we need to produce. We have an archaic, inefficient, and, um, and uh, overloaded transmission system that is also misaligned. If you're a Texas wind farm owner, you cannot sell your electrons in New York City because the archaic lines that we, write, that we have now is no good for long haul transmissions. The electrons will, dis, um, will diffuse before they cross the Mississippi River. So we need to build a backbone, a federal backbone, this should be the first thing that the new president does, is to build, construct, invest in a federal backbone to carry electrons efficiently across the country and to align our, our transmission system with the big energy production areas in the country. The big wind farms, we have enough harnessable wind in, in you know, the, the Midwest, Midwest is the Saudi Arabia of wind. We have enough harnessable wind in Montana, North Dakota, and Texas to supply all the electrical needs of our country. We have enough solar in 19% of the most barren desert land in the desert southwest to supply all of our country. The problem is the transmission lines don't reach those areas. So we need lines that reach those areas that can carry the power from those areas to the rest of the country. And we need an open grid where everybody has access to that grid. We can't, the, the other obstacle, and this comes to the answer to your question, is that in 50 states, we have 50 public utility commissions, each with an arcane and Byzantine set of rules that restricts access to the grid. If you are, if you have solar panels on your house, and during some part of the day, your home is producing more energy than it's using, you ought to be able to sell that energy on the grid and, make, and get marketplace rates for it. There's no place in the country where you can do that reliably. There's many states that have opened the grid, but none of them will actually pay you marketplace rates and let you sell unlimited amounts of energy. That is a big constraint on America getting energy independence. So the new president has to go and work with the governors and the PUCs in all the different states and say to them, we are not going to allow you to deny access to the grid anymore. You can still regulate energy production in your state. You can regulate transmission. You can make money from the transmissions, but we're not going to let you deny access to the grid. We need an open marketplace. When we need a marketplace that does what a market is supposed to do, which is to to, to reward, to punish bad behavior, which is inefficiency, and to reward good behavior, which is efficiency and waste. Right now, we have a marketplace in this country that does just the opposite. It is rigged to reward the dirtiest, filthiest, and most expensive producers of energy. There's no way, there's no way, you know, people talk about, about clean coal and about coal for four cents a kilowatt. There's no such thing as four cents a kilowatt coal. If you add in the externalities, the fact that in 19 states, every single freshwater fish in that state is now contaminated with mercury from the coal, that there's 60,000 Americans who die every year from ozone and particulate pollutions, a million asthma attacks, a million lost work days every, every year, all of these that were cutting down the mountains of West Virginia. We were cut, by the, by the time mountaintop on mining, mountaintop top removal, uh, companies like Massey Coal are done. They will have flattened an area with Appalachians the size of Delaware. They've already buried 2,200 rivers. They are, their acid rain has destroyed one fifth of lakes in the Adirondacks, and it has destroyed the forest cover on the high peaks of the Appalachians from Georgia all the way up into northern Quebec. These are the real costs of coal. If coal had to pay those impacts, of coal impose costs on the rest of us that should, in a true free market economy, be reflected in the price of that company's product when it makes it to market. And so what we need to do is to open a real marketplace that rewards the pe people 
who have innovators, who have, learned, who have learned new ways to conserve or produce energy, so that every American becomes an energy entrepreneur and every home becomes a power plant. That's what's going to free us from the domination, from the addiction of foreign oil. You know, this proposal to drill off the coast, it's just like, you know, this is, a, this is a proposal to give more crack to the crack addict. It's not going to solve the problem. And we have the solution, and we have it right here, and it's free market economics. The Republicans hate the free market capitalism. Probably uh, nobody has uh, thought more carefully or more deeply about what the president ought to do uh, relative to climate change. Uh, Bill Becker has been the uh, director for the Climate Action Project. You can go to www.climateactionproject.com and download the report, which is still in transition to be delivered to the next president-elect uh, 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 after the election. But it is a, a thoroughgoing transition plan. Bill, uh, two questions for you. First, if you could get the ear of both candidates, and, and I think you will, what would you say to them in, let's say, three minutes or less? Why should climate, following Bobby's point, why should climate appear as a prominent item in the Republican platform? And then secondly, where does this issue fit relative to the other issues on this long and growing list of nationally urgent problems? OK. Um, First thing I would say to the Republican candidate for president is this is a bona fide national security issue, climate change is. And they don't have to take it from us. The National Intelligence Council at the end of June declared in a secret report, but there was congressional testimony, that climate change is a threat multiplier, a bona fide national security issue that needs to be addressed right away. And so as the candidates talk about who's the one who should answer the phone at 3 a.m. or who's got the best, the best credentials to handle our national security, Climate change needs to be at the top of that list. And we need to talk to them, have them talk to us about the security implications of having major climate disruption in some of the most volatile regions of the world. The second thing I would tell them is that most of the things that are on the mind of the American voter today, as you look at the polls, are connected to climate change. It is the mother of all economic issues, the mother of all environmental issues. It will affect public health. It will affect the nation's energy security and prices. As I mentioned, it will affect national security, you go down the list of what people in jobs, certainly as Bobby and others have talked about, you go down the list and we're talking climate. And you can't achieve any of the goals that people are worried about unless you tackle this one. And the thing is that people don't talk, talk about very much, and the candidates need to, is that climate change is here and now. It's not just a polar problem. It's not a problem just for our kids. It's happening right now, right here. And you'll begin to see the scientists start to use the present tense about extreme weather and drought and forest fires and the like. And the weather patterns we've seen this past year are at the leading edge of what's going to get much worse. So we can't have security. We can't have jobs, secure jobs. We can't have secure energy prices unless we deal with climate change. And the presidential candidates need to address it. Michelle, you get to uh, write a paragraph in the acceptance speech for both Obama and McCain. What would you say? What would you want in that paragraph? I would commit to the people in the country on the ground that have been trying tirelessly to put this issue forward on the agenda of our elected officials at the federal level for more than two decades. I would commit to them that we would implement effective, intelligent federal policy that would support and reinforce the priorities that they brought to the table. I would acknowledge the leadership of mayors and county executives across the country, including our own here, our host mayor, Mary Hickenlooper, and ask them what they need to do more of what they're doing. Again, as Mr. Kennedy said, certainly opening up the grid so that there's more access. We know the energy is there. It's not a supply issue, it's an access issue. We would also legislate in a positive way that transportation and land use state level all the way down to local elected officials would be designed for a sustainable, low-impact future that also celebrates the opportunities that strong progressive climate action invite. Joe, thanks. Bobby?
question for you. You've been involved in and around presidential politics for a long time. The issue of climate change in particular ranks uh, below, I think, the 20th issue of importance to Americans. It's just not on our radar screen. If you were advising either candidate relative to the placement of this issue into this election campaign, what communication strategy would you recommend? I would say, I, you know, I would explain to the American public that all of the things that we need to do to deal with climate change are things that um, we need to do anyway if we're going to protect our national security, if we're going to have a, if we're going to maintain our moral authority around the world, if we're going to maintain the leadership of the United States and the prestige the United States has enjoyed around the, around the world for our generations, um, if we're going to continue to enjoy our reputation as an exemplary nation, and if we're going to protect our domestic economy, if we're going to build jobs. You know, when I was a boy, our country owned half the wealth on the face of the earth. And today we're hemorrhaging that money, and it's going over to um, people who, as I said, don't share our values. This is not good for our country. Oil addiction has robbed us of our national prestige. It has destroyed our economy. Um, and it's, and I think um, what people who are concerned about this issue, about global, the issue of global warming, have to continue to link it to the issues of economy, of prosperity, of jobs, and of national security and foreign policy. And I think it's critical that we continue to do it. And, and that, um, and, you know, that the people who have been, and, and that is the one thing that is having an effect. You know, the, if you look at the people who are piling on this issue, it's, it's blue chip, um, Wall Street, uh, Fortune 500 companies are understanding now that there's profits in green, that it's bad for our country, that national security experts are looking at this issue and saying, this is the only thing that we can do. You know, in, in World War II, we had oil rationing in this country as a national security issue. It's much more clear that we need to limit our use of fossil fuels today. So I, I would link it to those issues and not continue to, to talk simply about global warming because the, um, the pain of global warming is not being experienced on a day-to-day -day basis by most Americans. The pain of, of, a, of, of the price of oil rising in the gas tank is being experienced every day by Americans. And I think that's what the way that we have to talk about these issues. Great answer. Thanks. Bill? We've talked quite a bit about how to frame this issue because it's one of the most esoteric issues we've asked the public ever to understand. And what we came up with is, I think it's very true, what we're really about here is building a brand new economy. Our co economy is dysfunctional. It doesn't work anymore in the new realities of this century. And there are a bunch of them that we have to face, including climate change. So we've talked about building an economy that gives us security, prosperity, and opportunity, and stewardship. And we need to engage in national discussion. We have the technology right now for President Obama to hold a national discussion with all the cities and all the people in this country around what kind of new economy do we want? What do we want for the future? How do we start to build it? So we're really in a period of economic transformation where we need to be to redesign the economy so it works right now, doesn't it? You know, uh, question for all three of you. The issue of climate change has such a degree of urgency about it. Jim Hansen, as uh, Chuck pointed out in the previous panel, uh, is now saying we need to get back to 350 parts per million, we're at 387, and then we eventually need to transition back to about 300 parts per million CO2. We're headed for 450 or 500. There isn't a sense of urgency about this, and there is a real divide, it seems to me, among climate scientists, the people who study climate for a living, and have to live by the uh, rigors of peer review, fact, logic, data, and evidence, or they don't eat and the politicians who look at simply what is politically possible. The question for all three. In this election, we were told, we assumed that bad news doesn't sell, that the climate scientists have a lot of bad news. The people who work on the political side say you've got to sell this as a market opportunity. So between these two positions, how is it we can get the sense of urgency called for by the scientists that uh, accurately reflects our situation in the world, and yet still mobilize and galvanize people to act. 
So I'm going to toss that one up in the air. You can bat it around. And then I'll tell you what I want to do. I'd like to open the floor to uh, 10 minutes or so of questions from the, the audience that you, uh, you may have. So anybody want to take that one on, Bill? Yeah, I'll start because I've got the mic in hand. Um, I, I have a feeling, and it's just a gut feeling, that uh, we haven't asked enough of our presidents in recent years, and they haven't asked enough of us. I think there is a body of the American public that's waiting to be asked to do something about all these problems. And no one's had the courage in our political leadership, I shouldn't say no one, but very few have had the courage to call on the American people to act. Whether you call that sacrifice, whether you call that building the future, whatever it might be. And I think the next president needs to rally the American people to get involved in this issue and can construct this as a very positive issue. Not easy, but positive. That the outcome, the work that we have to do, is going to be marvelous. It's going to be marvelous for us alive today and those to follow. So I think the, American, the president needs to ask us to help. And I think we'll respond. I'd add to that, uh, through our organization, a terrible acronym, ICLE, the International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives. We're a nonpartisan organization. We've been working with cities and counties across the country and across the world for years on this issue and others related to it. The, the fine line between creating a sense of urgency that then inspires a constant state of paralysis and the do nothing opposite side of that is the fine line that we need our next president to walk in the most effective way. We need our next president to understand that we as a community, as citizens in the country, and also that local elected leaders are at the ready to support effective legislation. We have more than a, almost a thousand mayors that have signed on to a climate agreement in lieu of this country ratifying the Kyoto Protocol. We have counties across the country that are taking some of the most aggressive measures to reduce their collective aggregate carbon footprint, and we have the numbers that can prove that. If we can ask our president how we can help him, and we can also demonstrate the power of action in dollars, in terms of building more resilient public infrastructure, we can get ourselves down a path that takes us out of the state of paralysis that a lot of individuals in the country are in, where they look to their federal elected leaders to get the job done and fix the problem. It's going to take everybody, and we need to give everyone something to do that's effective and smart and not lost in a game of politics that's really focused on the work and the action that it's going to require to get us back to 350 parts per million. I would say that the principal obstacles to um, us adopting a, um, an effective climate policy are, number one, the huge amounts of subsidies, as I said before, and the economic power of the incumbent industries, the carbon cronies of coal and oil, which have not only used their power to influence the political process, you know, more than half of the, of the um, the federal legislatures are essentially indentured servants to the oil industry and the coal industry. Um, they, they give, said that industry since 2002 has put $156 million into the political process. Um, that doesn't even include lobbying, it's direct um, contributions to politicians. So, um, you know, what, that, that's one of the principal uh, that those corporate contributions and the, and the control of the political process by those industries is one of the, um, the principal obstacles. The other obstacles, the functioning of the American press, that the press isn't really examining this issue. This is why this alternative press that we're working with today, it's very important what you're doing, because if you go to the mainstream media, you don't see political issues, you don't see the dots connected, you don't see political issues explored the way they're supposed to be. On our public airwaves, you see Lindsay Lohan, you see Paris Hilton. Um, you know, Americans know more about Tom Cruise and Kate than they do about global warming, and they don't understand the solutions are out there. There's been no exploration in the American press. You know, they've um, they've abandoned their obligation to inform the American public, and are instead appealing to the lowest common denominator, which is 
the prurient interest that all of us have in the reptilian core of our brains for sex and celebrity gossip. So we, you can't have you can't have a democracy very long if you don't have an informed public. And um, if the public had this information and understood that we really do have an alternative, that we don't have to keep drilling for oil, that we don't have to keep poison, destroying our mountaintops and destroying our, the health of our children with coal, that we have much cheaper, you know, um, I'm on the board of a, a, a company called Vantage Point, of a venture capital firm, which is the largest uh, green tech venture capital firm in the country. We just signed a contract, one of our groups, Bright Source, with the state of California to build a gigawatt um, power plant, it's as big as a nuclear power plant, um, in the California desert. Um, it's a $9 billion contract over 10 years, and, um, and we can build it faster, cheaper, more efficiently than a coal plant, and with less of a full, much less of a, of a, of a footprint on the, on the ground in a coal plant or an oil plant or a gas plant, far cheaper than a new plant. So this is out there. One other company that we're working with is rewiring Israel. Israel is going to be off gasoline within three years. Their car is going to be all electric. And they're, because they have this vast receptacle now of, of car batteries, they're going to be able to build huge wind farms, solar farms in the Negev Desert, and they're going to have a reservoir to store that energy. If Israel can do it, we can do it here. And they're doing it without sacrifice because it's going to cheapen the driving miles from about 40 cents a mile for the average driver to about 6 cents a mile for the average driver. And the cars are going to be fast, efficient, and safe. So we can do this, and we can do it with, we don't need a tremendous amount of sacrifice. What we need to understand is that we've got to go through a transition and that there may be some sacrifice in that transition for some members of our society. But in the long run, all of us are going to be more prosperous and we can do better. Um, the, you know, the obstacle to that is the huge amounts of money that are being put into the political process to control the political process by the incumbents and to control the public mind. These you know, hundreds of think tanks on Capitol Hill led by the Heritage Foundation, the American Enterprise Institute, the Competitive Enterprise Institute, that are constantly trying to brainwash the public and say the only solution is oil and coal. You know, there is no global warming. And they hire all of these phony scientists like Fred Singer, these tobacco scientists, or these biostitutes who will say anything that you know the industry wants them to say. And those are really the obstacles to us making this transition which is a transition that's going to make our country richer. It's going to make every American more prosperous. It's going to make a, a, it's going to give us cleaner atmosphere for our children. It's going to make us. A, 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 it's going to preserve us from three trillion dollar wars in the Middle East and from entanglements with with Mid Eastern dictators who despise democracy and are hated by their own people. So all of the things that are going to happen to us from executing this transition are going to be good things. But we need a president who is able to articulate that vision to the American public and say, during my administration, we are going to go through a profound transformation. We are going to escape the addiction of coal and oil, and this is something that's going to be good for every American, and there's going to be tremendous, tremendous resistance from these industries. And you know, the tobacco industry, for 60 years, was able to convince the American public that even though everybody knew the truth, that this was an industry that was killing one out of every five of its customers who used its product as directed, it was able to convince itself, the American public, that there was no damage from smoking cigarettes. And you remember seven years ago, when this, what we call the seven dwarfs, the seven heads of the biggest tobacco companies in this country, came before Congress, raised their right hand, and swore under oath that they did not believe that tobacco was bad for the American people. Well, the, the profits of the tobacco industry are minuscule compared to the tobacco, the, the profits from oil and coal. So, and you saw what they were able, what they were willing to do to hold on to those profits and to that power. And imagine what the coal industry, what companies like Massey, which is just a criminal enterprise, and Exxon, which is a criminal enterprise, what they will do to hold on to their power and what they're going to end. We need a president who will stand up to those com companies and say to the American public, what they are telling you is lies. And we're going to do something better with this country. We are better than that. Okay, let's, uh...
Bobby, where do you stand on the issue of coal and oil? <laughs> All right, now we're going to open up uh, uh, Q&A for you. We've got a few minutes left, but the rule of thumb is you have to be short. You cannot make a statement. You've got to identify yourself and your whole your stock portfolio, any holdings you've got in Exxon Mobil or Massey Energy. Uh, but be quick, concise, and Tom, be eloquent. I assure you we don't have a Massey call. Um, can you address the issue of the Warner Lieberman bill? Because that really doesn't go far enough, given what your 100-day plan is for the next administration. The Warner Lieberman bill just really didn't cut it. And what would you, how would you change about that? Can you address whether cap and trade, Bobby, really isn't part of these industries kind of trying to work towards the middle zone and neutralize the real change that needs to take place? And can cap and trade really solve that problem? Or is a tax a much better way to go in a credit system or feed tariff the way Randy Hayes is proposing? Um, in the context of the 100-day plan, what we've recommended, because the momentum seems to be behind cap and trade, is that the, uh, the trading and the allowance selling happen upstream. What that means is we, we sell the allowances or offer them to the place at which fossil fuels come into the economy, the mine mouth, the wellhead, the port. If you do that, you're dealing with 2,500 entities rather than 15 or 20,000 entities. You wouldn't have all the gaming and the Rube Goldrick kind of contraption that's being produced on the hill right now. You'd have 100% sale of allowances, it would be transparent, it would be simple, and relatively easy to administer. Uh, and it needs to be more aggressive in terms of its targets than Warner Lieberman is on the Hill. And quickly, I just want to say one thing about what Bobby said about subsidies. The interesting thing is that no one has ever inventoried all the subsidies we're giving to carbon in this economy. We're paying each other to emit carbon. What sense does it make to put a price on carbon with a cap and trade system and distort the market signals with subsidies on the other side? It makes no sense at all. Okay. Next question. Can I can I just Go respond ahead. to the cap and trade? Um, the, the benefits of cap and trade, Tom, are two. One is that it, it's much more immediately responsive. Um, the attacks on carbon, which I agree in, on completely, because I think what you want to do, you know, you want to tax things that are bad. You want to punish bad behavior, and that's what a marketplace should do. Uh, uh, and we want to reward good behavior. And the best way of doing that across the board is to simply tax carbon until we tax it out of existence. But uh, what we found is that, um, that a, 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 a across the board tax on carbon simply does not get you the very quick response that you need. If you look at this administration of the past four years, um, uh, gasoline, the price of gasoline has risen from about a dollar and so 37 cents a gallon four dollars a gallon and the amount of uh, driver miles that have been reduced is about 0.02 percent so there was no real public response even though you had a you know a, a giant raise in the, in the, in the and you had a, essentially a giant tax on carbon it wasn't going to the government it was going to Exxon but it's a, essentially a tax on carbon so it's not as effective or direct or targeted as a cap and trade system it's also a political death for any politician who stands up and pushes it. Um, and you look, you know, it was the first item agenda for the, for the, um, for the uh, Clinton-Gore administration. It was Gore's, uh, you know, we had a, a BTU tax at the beginning of the Bush-Gore administration. And you had these constituencies that rallied against it so effectively, starting with the Teamsters Union, with groups that were working for poor who said it was a regressive tax. And then, of course, funded by the big oil industry and the big carbon cronies, and it's almost impossible barrier, poses almost an impossible barrier for politicians to get by. Cap and trade, on the other hand, is favored by industry because it is a market-based approach. The ideologues in the Republican Party can also um, embrace it because it's market-based, and we know that it works, and it gives people the opportunity to make money quickly. Large companies. Um, the opportunity to make money by reducing their carbon. And so it's much more targeted and it has a much more, much quicker response. And that's one of the reasons that people who favor it continue to say it's a much better thing in the short term. It's a much easier thing to get through. You know, both candidates are, are endorsing it. What price does carbon get if it becomes innovation? Well, what, what, I mean, the way Wait, that Let's get a quick answer here. We have five people stacked up here. So what price? What price does it need to get to? Yeah. I think that's, a, that's gonna be market-based again. What, what you do is, 
you, you know, you make an inventory of all the carbon that's released this year, and you say, okay, we're going to sell that many carbon credits, and we're going to do it by auction. And next year, we're going to reduce those by 20%. So the auction price is going to go up. And then every year, you reduce it by 10%. Every year, they have to come and rebid it. And, and the, the rewards for innovation, reducing tar of carbon, go up year by year dramatically as you reduce the amount of carbon that can be reduced. The okay. way that they did it in Europe and the way that they've done it here in the past is wrong, which is what they've done is they've gone out and handed the carbon credits to people who emitted carbon. So that if you were emitting huge amounts of carbon, they said to you, well, you have kind of grandfathered right to emit carbon, so we're giving you the carbon credits. And it was like giving a, a, a bank robber the, the license to continue to rob banks. You know, and what we should have done is said, here's the total amount of carbon to do that is out there. And if you want it, you've got to bid on it. You've got to bid against everybody else. And that system will work. The other system just simply didn't work. Okay, we've got time for one more question. Name, and please target the question very carefully. My name is Eric Smetterman, and uh, my question to you all is, right now, energy efficiency and renewable energy have become a giant issue because Americans are being hit hard in the gas tank and in the wallet. And my question, my question to all of you is, what will it take to keep the momentum on to build these kinds of renewable technologies should oil companies open up new supplies that actually decrease the price? price goes down, how do you keep this, this momentum going? Michelle, you want to take that one? Sure. I, I think you've, you've already heard from the panelists today and, and those previously. There is so much opportunity in the market. And if we can release access to the grid so that all of those renewable sources that exist and the technologies that have been tested that we know work are made accessible and people, as Bobby said, can become energy entrepreneurs exercise their right and their will. We can solve any kinds of, of illusions, barriers. It's a market-based and a market-driven opportunity. We need, to, we need to open it up, we need to have access. Let me, uh, Bill, 10 seconds. Yeah, very quickly, uh, renewable energy portfolio standards, most of you in the room know that Colorado was the first, and I think still the only, state to pass a portfolio standard by citizen referendum. And what we found here is that we achieved that standard years ahead of schedule. And we went back and we increased it. Texas did the same thing. Years ahead of schedule, we underestimated the power of renewable energy to enter the marketplace. And now Texas is the number one wind producing state in the country. So I would say renewable energy portfolio standards are one of the tools we need. Let me, let me wrap this up by saying uh, thank you to all of you for being here. Thank you again to the Alliance for your leadership and sponsorship of this. Uh, on this platform with me are two genuine heroes and one heroine. You figure out which is which. But I want to thank the panelists for all that they do, all the work that they do, and thank you, all of you, for being here. Thank you.